Pour ailleurs, en conne, nous battez qu'à chauffer les cabanes. C'est des coups de fouet pour te faire autant. En bas soleil, c'est des cabanes. Mettre la tête à crier. Good evening to each and every one. As we promised you on Talking Time, we told you you from since last week we were supposed to talk to uh, the leader of the United Workers Party, Mr. Lennox Linton, who is in studio too with us. And we were about to have a one hour. Uh, discussion with him uh, and I'm sure we're going to have a wonderful time with him this evening. Let me just go over here to Studio 2, Mr. Linton. Good evening, Manai. I, th- I want to thank you for accepting our invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. It's a real pleasure. Great joy and honor for me. The pleasure is always. Uh, today is, uh, of course, a great day for mothers around Dominica and not mothers around the world, uh, what we call Mother's Day, the 2014 version. I hope the mothers of Dominica had a Wonderful time, especially those in the Margot area. I want to say a special good evening to my own mother, Rachel Linton, and to all the other lovely mothers of Dominica. You know, they carry a great responsibility for us as we try to improve our humanity and play our role in global affairs. Okay, Mr. Linton, uh, tell, before we start, we'd like you to give us a little, tell us something, tell us about yourself. We have been hearing that you are a journalist. I knew that you worked with DCP uh-huh. and you worked uh, in many other islands in the region. Mm-hmm. And we have been hearing about your qualification, your <laughs> academic qualification. Now, we listen to you uh, f- to fluent in the Queen's language. Uh, we understood that Mr. Bellot uh, ref- uh, refused to advise the Prime Minister to have, uh, <laughs> or you call that again, a debate. A debate. A debate yes, yes. <laughs> he said that because of your, would you say the Marigot influence uh, helps to have you been able to use the English language as accurate as Mr. Bellot would say? Well, I... I grew up in Maragot, man. I, I uh, went to school in Maragot. There is a building there just below the church called Wall School. That's where I did um, primary and then um, graduated to the upper classes in o- what we call Old Zion in those days. And then from there, m- both of my parents were teachers. My, my father, principal of school. My mother ended up as a principal of school as well. And I- in those days, teachers were used to be transferred around the place. Uh, my, my father, in fact, worked here in Grand Bay for quite a number of years and, and has very good um, connections in the, in the Grand Bay community. We moved to, the family moved to Roseau, um, one of those years when both my mother and father were teaching in Roseau, my father at the Goodwill Secondary School and my mother at the Roseau Boys School, where I finished um, high school, um, not, not um, primary school, and from there, at the age of nine, I, I passed the common entrance exam and went to grammar school. So I spent five years at grammar school and uh, did my, my GC, then left. I didn't, I didn't go to college and I didn't go to university either. Uh, I started working as a teacher. I, I taught for some time at the Rosa Boys School and at the Rosa Girls School as well. And, and then I, I worked in the bank, the, the Royal Bank of Canada. I was a bank clerk there for a while. And then did my first stint at Dominica Coconut Products. I was offered a, a position there to understudy the course management accountant in those days. And there's where I learned to crunch numbers. There's where I learned about how the economy operates and, and business, what, you know, the, the difference between the private sector and the public sector and all that. Those, those are my early days of education on a, a gentleman by the name of Mr. Philip Nassif. Uh, who has been very instrumental in much of what I know about business today. I, I left uh, DCP and uh, went to do some other things. I was experimenting with this and that, trying to find my way around the world and, and then ended up in broadcasting. I got a job at uh, DBS Radio in the early 1980s and um, was an announcer there, a news reporter, in the days when um, Steinberg, Henry and myself used to be buddies then, Shermaine Green um, used to be reading the news uh, as well, uh, Rudy Joseph and Alwyn Bully was the general manager uh, in those days and uh, he was the one who had indicated to me that he thinks um, I should uh, apply for an opening that they had there because Alwyn was one of my English teachers at school 
and he knew of my interest in jazz he wanted me to come on board at the radio station uh, to you know just just to join the staff but also to pay attention to uh, a jazz program that they wanted to start there and I did that for a couple of years we call it jazz gold uh, on Wednesday nights and <laughs> that was kind of interesting I, I, I went um, from DBS to the Chronicle and ended up as, as editor there for a while I did uh, the University of Texas at Austin I went there for a six month special training program in broadcast news and when I came back to Dominica uh, I did an assignment in in Germany where there was some there was a program going on in Germany uh, a familiarization program that was you know about the German environment and in those days I think when I went there there was the uh, Berlin Trade Fair um, as well so I did that and I, I covered that for the Caribbean News Agency and uh, when I came back to Dominica they were offering me a position in their radio service in Barbados so that's how I moved from Dominica and went over to Barbados and, and worked there at the Caribbean News Agency headquarters as the senior producer in the radio service for about four years I, I was supposed to be in there for a one-year contract initially it extended it to two and then three and then four and at that point I was um, ready to come back home I <laughs> in in the meantime while I was in Barbados midway through the assignment I actually got married I, I married my sweetheart from Dominica and um, we spent uh, two years living our first two years of, of married life were in Barbados and then we relocated here and uh, at that point, I was um, trying to see what I should do in Dominica. I, I was looking around for things that were either not being done or were not being done properly. So I, I did quite a few things on my own in, in the field of uh, public relations, um, media strategy, and so on. Uh, much of the work I did in that first year I came back was for Dominica Coconut Products and uh, the Fort Young Hotel, the Springfield Group of Companies, companies that uh, Mr. Philip Nassif was, was directly involved in. And the following year, uh, he offered me a full-time position on the staff simply because of the, the volume of work I was doing with them and, and the fact that they, they needed someone like me to do those things in, in the company on a full-time basis. So I joined the staff and uh, remained there until uh, early part of 2003. In, in the first half of 2003, April, I left. But before that... The Nassifs had sold off their interest, and Colgate Palmolive, the global corporation based in New York, had uh, bought out the majority interest and uh, became the operators of the company here in Dominica. DCP at the time also had an equity interest in Barbados Cosmetic Products that was producing powder detergents, and we, uh, in and Colgate, we were also Colgate also bought that plant, and. When they did the assessments of what was happening in, in Dominica and what was happening in Barbados and how they were going to align the, the human resources at both plants to the business strategy in the Caribbean, they said the first thing they wanted to do was to make the plant in, in Barbados operate like the one in Dominica was operating in terms of the human resource management function. In those days, I was responsible for human resource management at, at DCP. And so they gave me the additional task of running the plant, running human resources for the plant in Barbados as well. And, and what that meant, man, I was that I was working here uh, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. And on, on Thursday morning, I was taking a plane. In those days, we had Nature Island Express flying out of Cane Field, getting me into Barbados at 7 o'clock in the morning. And I would take my car in the parking lot at Barbados and, and get into the office in Barbados before, before a number of the people who slept there the night before. So I would, I would work there on um, Thursday and Friday, come back home on Saturday to be at work in Dominica. So, and, and I did that for, for about a year. Um, following that, the Colgate Palmolive management, um, executive management team for the region, um, they decided that they wanted to change focus in Dominica and they wanted to do some they wanted to bring some new positions into the company um, that would help carry the strategic direction going forward and one of the positions that they wanted to fill was a position of logistics director uh, they asked me to to they, they offered me the job I, I sat with my boss and discussed it and he I said but I'm not an operations guy he said we'll make you an operations guy because we like the way you think um, he said I'm, I'm 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 in I'm in administration I've been so far corporate communications and um, 
the human resource management, marketing, and so on. They say, all right, that's fine. What, what we need is fresh thinking. Uh, and you're, kind of, you, you're the kind of guy who thinks outside of the box. We have seen you, so we want to give you this new position. We think you'll do well with it. And so I went into, they sent me to the United States to spend some time at the, the Atlanta facility of Colgate, where they were doing a lot of distribution and they were managing inventory for major players like Walmart in the American retail environment. And so I, I was able to, to work with the, with the young lady who was, who was responsible for our inventory managing our inventory in at, at Walmart and that was a fascinating experience because for the first time I was close close up and personal with the way uh, the technology had transformed retail in the in the American environment Th these point of sale machines we have where when you you go to the the supermarket the the cashier scans um, the the product that you're buying into the system Everywhere in America, everywhere in, in, in America that at Walmart that a bar of soap was being scanned from Colgate into the system, it would update the inventory on her computer screen and she would be in a position at the end of the week to know what amount of inventory had been depleted and when she was going to make, place another order on the plan to deliver to Walmart because Walmart was not touching your inventory. Walmart was telling you it is your responsibility to manage your inventory on our shelves. If there's no, if your product is not on our shelves, then that's your business. We'll find something else to put there. But we've given you the space, then you manage it. That was a, a huge eye opener for me in terms of um, vendor managed inventory. I went to conferences of the the Council of Logistics Management of, of America. Learned a lot there about um, how you source goods. Learned a lot there about cycle time and, and delivery of products and, and how you manage interfaces between um, purchasing on one hand and your manufacturing environment and the inf interface between the manufacturing and the delivery on the front end, which is what I was going to be responsible for in Dominica. And so having gotten that initial training on the job, you could call it, in the United States, I came back down to Dominica and um, started functioning as the supply chain manager the logistics director of the company in those days um, we started we started tracking how well we were performing with our on time and complete delivery of products to the trade us customers ordered from us uh, we were asking ourselves well how well we were doing in meeting customer orders and when we started tracking me me measuring those numbers back in 97 early part of 97 we were doing 75% case fill we were filling 75 percent of the cases that were ordered from us and uh, right there you saw the wonderful opportunity to fill the other 25 percent because after all um, <laughs> if you if you're only filling 75 out of every hundred cases that are ordered you're operating at 75 percent of your potential the question was how are we going to do that and and part of the the, the, the big responsibility for the job that i was given was to manage the functions the, the critical functions of the of the company which is sourcing making and delivery to ensure that we had seamless transition across all three functions and the customer orders were being met on time and complete when i left the position in 2003 we had moved our case fill from 75 percent uh, six years back to 99.23 percent and uh we were we were i should tell you shipping out of dominica over a thousand cases of a thousand containers how many people 20 foot containers how many people you employed then over, over 300 300 and we were shipping out uh, a thousand 20 foot containers of product we for years we had been doing that from our own wharf at, at the back of the of the company there in Belfast and we were bringing in maybe anywhere between four and five hundred uh, containers of raw materials in order to convert into finished goods so we, we were we were the division i was responsible for uh, on the front end and the back end of the of the business was was responsible for somewhere in the region about 70 70 million dollars in operating resources wow and um so it was it was a huge responsibility i was i felt very privileged to be able to add some value so why didn't you comp uh, continue with the uh, the company well the, 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 remember we were we are an international company mm -hmm. um, colgate palmolive was um making changes and and they were 
restructuring the business and one of the the, the same position that they created um, they were eliminating it um, back in in 2003 and, and so we we sat down and had some discussions as to what should happen uh, and I basically at that point exercised the option that was given to me to move on okay so we we sat down and negotiated a separation package which was um, very much to my liking and satisfaction okay and so i moved on and i thought that you you migrate to other islands in the region where uh, you, after where, that yeah after that the opportunity presented itself for me to get back into broadcasting uh, i should say that while i was doing that work at dcp down at colgate uh, a lot of dominicans were not aware of that because i was also at the same time doing television uh, people were seeing me on the television every Wednesday and every Saturday night doing what about and uh, in for a couple of years after 2000 doing Good Morning Dominica as well so the, the, in the public mind Lennox was the broadcaster on television but substantively I was involved with my logistics and customer service and uh, human resource management functions at, at, at Colgate DCP first and then Colgate later and when we, when I moved on from there, I, I saw the opportunity for a, a change of a change of focus. So I, I accepted an offer to go to work in Antigua at the Observer Radio, and I did that for a couple of years, and um, then ended up in, in in trouble with the owners of the of the station. Um, they wanted me to do things that I thought were professionally unacceptable. And uh, in those circumstances, I always trust my better judgment, regardless of what the consequences are. And so we had a falling out, which meant that in uh, uh, 2006, somewhere around there, I was, um, my, my position was terminated with the company. I, my children were with me at the time they were at school. My wife was also in Barbados and was employed on a work permit there. And... Uh, we, we came and spent Christmas uh, in Dominica and then went back to, to Antigua on the understanding that we would keep the children at school until the, year, until the school year finished. My wife's contract would, would be a little longer than that, so we would, we would write that out. But in the event that I myself did not get anything else to do in, in Antigua, I would, um, we would relocate back to Dominica. So I, I, I was there basically freelancing and, and doing a few things for a couple of clients, um, basically minding my own business. And then um, the, the government that had taken a dislike to me because of certain questions I raised and certain issues that I facilitated discussions on uh, ended up um, issuing a deportation order for me to leave Antigua. I had to leave my wife and children behind because um, I had just I dropped them to school that morning and came back home and while I was there uh, I heard a knock on the door and there were these um, immigration officers saying I needed to come down to the immigration department um, remember prior to that I had worked on separate work permits that were issued by the Antigua government for me to work as manager of Observer Radio so it's not that I was not a suitable or fit and proper person to be working in Antigua. I had not been involved in anything illegal. I had not been in trouble with the law at all. This was straight politics. This was straight uh, political victimization, if you will. And so um, I left Antigua. When I was at the airport, I, I got a call from the Prime Minister of Dominica uh, who asked me what, what went on. And I explained to him, he said he was going to call the... Prime Minister of Antigua to see what was what was what because at the, at that point Roosevelt Skerritt was the CARICOM Prime Minister who had lead responsibility for the free movement of people in the sub region and so that matter would would often even though it didn't involve me personally if anybody else it, it involved whether they were from Antigua or Grenada or Jamaica it should have concerned him because he was the one given and who accepted lead responsibility for the free movement of people initiative okay mr linton we will stop here and uh, we'll go over here to uh, uh youtube and have a little uh, uh from an interview you uh, you hosted with the then prime minister R R mr scarrett mm -hmm. and we're going to listen to a little um, a, a little from that interview and then we'll come back okay Let's just listen to that as I'm about. 
uh, it's a good Monday morning in Dominica. As so welcome, Bruce Scarrett, new MP for the Vegas constituency, and a gentleman tip to take over the responsibility for youth and youth affairs and sports in the new government of Rosie Douglas. Good morning again, welcome. Uh, this is a, a very interesting time for you. Yes, sir. Thank you. And um, good morning to my people in Vegas and Tibo and the rest of the country. Special good morning to Vincent Lawson and the Prime Minister and my friend from the character issue, Mr. Grano. I, I hope Martin will be bringing um, cable to Penville soon. I'll be hoping to discuss with, the, uh, with Mr. Um, Abraham about bringing Martin to my people in Penville so they can see what's happening in Dominica and the rest of, and the, rest of the world. Yeah. But it's, it's an interesting time for me and um, for young persons across the country. I think um, my appointment as, as a Minister of Affairs, um, the young people feel much more comfortable having somebody who, who they can identify with and who they feel that they can come to at any time to speak about issues affecting them. Because the issues that affect young persons also affect me. Mm -hmm. um, so they feel much more comfortable having a young person in, in that position. Mm -hmm. What will be your first order of business? Well, my first order of business is, is to get acquainted with the ministry, um, to meet the, the administrators, the sports coordinator and the um, chief um, youth development officer and, and all the staff, supporting staff. And then I will be meeting um, various youth groups across the country and um, in also sports groups. As a matter of fact, last night I had some discussion with um, some of the young boys, from, from young men from the Dame Central. So I, I've started discussing, um, and one of my greatest concerns is um, the, the fact that there's no money for the, for the sports stadium. Mm -hmm. So now uh, they have placed another headache on me to, to, to raise funds with the Prime Minister to bring in the sports stadium to Dominica. You're committed to doing that? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. But I think we need to revisit the plan, though, because the existing um, plan for the stadium does not um, solve any existing problems. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can't have cricket and football being played in Dominica at the same time. Mm -hmm. And I think we should go ahead and, and, and change that plan and do something like Grenada, where you have a separate cricket ground and, and, and a football and track and field. So, uh, so at the end of the day, we can, West Indies and England could play in Dominica, where and Africa and Dominica could play in football at the same time. Mm -hmm. The, the, the youth and sports affairs will be one part of your responsibility. The other part, of course, in Parliament, you're going to be representing the people of ACAS, Penville, Thibault. You're looking forward to heading into Parliament? And yes, sir. I'm excited about it um, because there are some issues that we have to discuss. And as you say, my interest also is, is representing the people of, of my constituency. And I've, I've spoke, spoken about um, getting them involved in central government by setting up various committees. Mm -hmm. I think that's crucial. Mr. Linton, what type of person you saw the day that you interviewed him compared to today? At the time, back in 2000, a young man who had offered himself for, for public office, there's a lot I didn't know about the circumstances under which he came into public office because it was subsequent to that interview I learned that himself and others had accepted money from Rosie Douglas so that they could run and then uh, early in the play placed pressure did, you, did he mention that in the interview? no well that wasn't an interview at all okay, okay. Uh, early early in the play placed pressure on Rusi for them to be ministers in their own right after Rusi had determined that they should be junior ministers and be given the opportunity to work along with somebody more senior and get their feet wet so when you say they uh, are you, are you Roosevelt Skerritt Roosevelt Skerritt more specifically and Vince Henderson okay. those, those were the younger members of the of the team but, but at the point I, w I was talking to him, just as another young man who had stepped forward and who wanted to represent his constituency, who wanted to play, who felt that it was within his capability to play a role in government. And uh, a lot has happened since then. Uh, the, the, the gentleman I spoke to back then certainly is not the gentleman that is running Dominica today because all of the concerns he had about campaign financing and so on, that has totally gone through gone through the window. doesn't seem to be concerned about that anymore. Uh, he was the gentleman, that, that gentleman I spoke to then was the one who on, in 2000 on the Labour Party campaign in an advertisement was holding hands with Pierre Charles and others and praying for the defeat of corruption in Dominica. Now under his watch under his watch we have seen corruption like we have never seen before in the history of Dominic, and he doesn't seem to be concerned about that. So, so we, we're talking about two different people. We're looking at a classic example, perhaps, of how uh, politics allows us to really showcase who we really are. Because I, I don't think politics changes people. I think politics gives people the opportunity to, to really show their true colors. Let's return to the political business. Uh, knowing that you are the leader of the United Workers Party today, today, 
and your supporters, and we know that supporters of political parties, whenever their parties form the government, mm. they are looking for benefits. Mm. You know, and we tend to see there are political appointed jobs and uh, you have people who are on boards and uh, have been paid for as directors. And how are you going to deal with, if it at all you become the Prime Minister of Dominica, how are you going to deal with all of the people that are surrounding you, uh, supporting the movement, the UWP, when it comes to benefiting econo financially, how are you going to deal with that? Because it seems to me, politics, not only in Dominica, but it, people goes into it for benefits. Okay, how are you going to put me mechanisms in place to enable the, the country not to suffer financially, economically, based on that type of culture? All right. Well, you raise a very important point. Number one, as th this movement for change... It's a very important movement. I, I, I keep telling people that we are not talking about a red Dominica, a blue Dominica, a green Dominica, or any other colored Dominica. We are talking about the Commonwealth of Dominica, which means we will be a government for all Dominicans. We, we value, we appreciate the support that we receive from people all around the country, but we are careful that they need to understand what, what this change means is that first and foremost you will have a government for all Dominicans a government that distributes the resources of the country based on merit a government that that decides on assignments and appointments based on merit based on capability not not based on party loyalty there there there's, there's, there's circumstances in which we have seen over the years somebody who is totally unsuitable for a job a public interest position is given the job that they cannot do but because of their party affiliation they will get the job we're saying that we cannot make significant progress in Dominica if that does not change we have to understand that our people are our people hard times belong to all of us because right now I don't know what people believe what the Dominica I see people from all political persuasions are suffering whether they are blue they're red they're green they're yellow all dominicans are suffering under the weight of unemployment so when we think of putting a plan together to create 5,000 jobs in the first three years we're not we're not thinking of creating 5,000 blue jobs <laughs> we're creating 5,000 jobs for the people of dominica so that the young people can start earning their own money and start building the discipline of life which is so important and the esteem and the self-confidence you get that takes you through life successfully so we know that over the years the, the situation of having the public purse available to you has been used by political parties to dole out political favors and to buy political support I have no intention of doing that I don't think the people of Dominica want to elect me to do that. I think they want a team that will go in there honestly and get the work of the country done. And it means much will have to change. Man, I don't, I don't know if people understand that winning the election is actually the easy part of this. The hard work comes when we get in there and we faced with the challenge of rescuing, really, really changing Dominica from what it has become into what we would like it to be. And what we would like for Dominica is for it to become the best place to live, the best place to work, and the best place to enjoy life in the global community. Another question I'd like to ask you, Mr. Linton, is we know of people, some candidates who would uh, win the, 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 their seat on a, a, a not another party, and because of some conflict, they would go to join another party. The resources that the party used to enable that candidate to be successful at the polls mm -hmm. is being used in the be beneficial benefit to another party who did not really contribute towards mm -hmm. his winning. <laughs> what type would you like to amend the law? In, uh, would you like to change the rules that governs that w w if you become the prime minister? Absolutely, man. I absolutely because this is very important. You cannot campaign on the ticket of a political party through the election you win your seat on the ticket of that party which means that the people have accepted you 
as part of this group going into the parliament and then you decide because of something or another you are going to change your allegiance and go to the other side i don't believe that you have the moral authority to do that i think the only honorable thing available for you to do is to resign the position and go back to the people let the people decide on whose ticket or based on wrapped in which colors they want to see you in the parliament it is not for you to take what the people have given to you honestly and determine what you want to do with it for your own selfish reasons in any circumstance like that man I I believe there has to be a resignation and the person if they so desire must face the polls again so that the people can determine under what arrangements and through what circumstances they want them there if they wanted them there as independent people that they could make their own choice and make their own decision they would have done that or the person would have run as an independent he has the opportunity he or she has the opportunity to do that now that they're changing allegiance to to let the people decide you are our independent voice in the parliament or you are belonging to this party or that party but the people must make that choice the people put you there as x and if you want to change why you, the circumstances in which you're there the people must have their say this is a democracy of the people by the people for the people and any action where somebody can unilaterally decide without referring back to the people that they're changing their allegiance is an act of treachery and betrayal and i don't stand for it i think we need to change the laws and the constitution in that regard okay in context to do with the dual citizenship would you amend the law the dual citizenship is about allegiance. I don't see how it's workable for someone to be an al under allegiance to a foreign power or state and be representing Dominica at the level of government. I, I don't see how that's possible in the parliament of but Dominica. But if, if someone has a British passport, does he have the right to also take part? Well, 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 well over the years, um, we've been former colonies of Britain and so on. We have this... Uh, <laughs> we have this arrangements and this um, relationships within the Commonwealth and if you notice the Constitution said that um, Commonwealth um, citizens can vote in the elections can become senators and, and so on and um, so there's that but then if you come from outside the Commonwealth the situation is different I just in, in principle have, have a difficulty with um, divided loyalties um, if you are under allegiance to some other country, uh, it may be a Commonwealth country, maybe another country. I'm not. I'm, it's, suppose a conflict comes up between countries, between both countries. Where where will your loyalty be? We have to think about those things. Yeah, I can understand. But uh, how how powerful is Dominica to have any conflict with any superpower, such as the America, I, I, France? I don't know. I, 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 you uh, see, that would uh, create a, a problem for us. I think uh, any of these countries are having a problem with us can switch us, switch us off as easy as they would like. Now, so okay. what about a man who has dual citizenship and he's, he has the capability of contributing towards the development of the country? No, and but, but man, I, clearly it is something that we need to rethink. The, the Constitution of Dominica was uh, set up back in 1978. So we're dealing with the 1978 Constitution at the time we became independent. That is uh, 36 years ago and uh, these things must be subject to periodic review we must now ask ourselves the very same question that you're asking me this this now becomes a question for dominica is dominica okay with the dual citizenship disqualification as spelled out at article 32 1a of the constitution that's a legitimate question because i may feel one way about it the people of dominica may feel some other way about it having regard to the number of our brothers and sisters who have made their homes in the united states in in, in europe in, in france in, in britain in canada elsewhere but who would like to make some contribution to their country uh, they have a second citizenship what are they going to do are, are we going to continue to disqualify them or are we going to change the constitution and uh, allow them to be able to participate that's the question my immediate gut reaction and coming out of the concern is how do you deal with divided loyalties in that set of circumstances because when you become a citizen of the united states for example you're basically taking an oath of allegiance that commits you to service of the united states and no one else right uh, and if you read the wording of the oath carefully it renounces all of the allegiances that you have had 
So, so in order for you to accept this, you have you've gone and taken an oath that says, from now on, America is my country. That's why I respect. Now, for you to for you to leave that and say, well, I still have a Dominican passport, and Dominica recognizes dual citizenship, so I want to serve in the Parliament of Dominica. And then at the, at, at, when you're serving in the Parliament of Dominica, the country that you have committed to say, oh, we're going to war with um, somebody else on the other side of the world, we need you, we need you in the army. What, what, what do you do? There, there are some practical considerations that must come into the mix as well as we as we think this through going forward. But I, I'm I'm with you on the point that it's something to discuss and something to see where people's heads are so many years later. You have been to Grand Bay on many occasions. You have visited the village. Yeah. You being the prime minister in the next general elections, what is your first move for Grand Bay? The the first move for Grand Bay will be to to ensure that the people of Grand Bay understand the importance of the economic development and the social development program that we have for the entire country and what it means for Grand Bay. Now, when we came, every time that we have come to Grand Bay, we we satisfied that we're seeing the priority of joblessness, of of of, of a solution to joblessness, staring us straight in the face. The priority of fixing agriculture. The priority of ensuring that the benefits of this new tourism that we want to see in, in Dominica come to Grand Bay. The priority of looking at across the bay and seeing Martinique down the road and, and, and seeing the possibility of significant agricultural produce moving from here across the water to Grand Bay and how we can facilitate that. We want to bring Grand Bay on board with that sort of direction. But you see... The, 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 the communities of Dominica, if you take them village by village, you would see uh, a significant decline in the village economies over the years with the demise of bananas and the failure of government to come up with a solution to agriculture in the exit of its main crop bananas. Not, not that we could not have done better, just that we did not do better. So this doing better now forces us, compels us to engage with the community of Grand Bay in a different sort of way. We, we have to look at the, the assets that Grand Bay comes to the table with naturally. For years we have referred to this village as our cultural capital. Why have we done that? Simply because of the natural talents and, and abilities of Grand Bay people in dance, in art, in creative expressions which they have brought to the national stage. We have seen them over and over and over again. So when we talk about uh, a revolution in the cultural industries, uh, that will have significant meaning for the people of Grand Bay. In, in terms of priorities, though, Manai, um, our style is for the people of Grand Bay to inform themselves to play a role in informing what the priorities should be. You see, in, in our heads, there are ideas. But for the people of Grand Bay, this might come before that. And so we're willing to have a government that engages the people on that level. That's why we will have... We, that's why we have representation at the constituency level. We have uh, Mr. James Alexander and his team who are busy at work spreading the message and going into homes and registering people. Um, so they're all not only limited to that. When we take government, we're going to be depending on the very same people, very same network, the, the government's network of people in the constituency, the village council and, and so on. To, to sit with us and to help determine what the priorities will be. Um, we're not going to be a government that micromanages where individual ministers of government are there, for example, handing out favors uh, to people and so on. They, they, the agents of the state, the public servants, will be allowed to do their work in the public interest and we will focus on dealing with the policy issues and ensuring that the people are properly aligned to the national development strategy. So, coming in office, what new are we going to expect? In, in, you said that in a matter of three years, you, the, the United Workers Party would create 5,000 5, jobs. 5, jobs yes. But in a matter of one year, what should we expect to see uh, on the, under your administration, if at all you... If we win the win, government. Win, win, yeah. Some people say, when we win the government. When you win, yeah. Okay. All right, all right. You will see a, a government that functions differently. For example, right off the bat... We have to begin with the planning and executing the plans for the revival of agriculture. Now, 
agriculture is important to Grand Bay? Is it important to Petit Savan? It's important to all of the communities around Dominica. You would have heard us speaking in, in recent times about our plans for the essential oil industry and uh, where we can earn uh, a share of the global trade in vetiver oil and patchouli and uh, bay oil and, and so on. So we would hit the ground running with work on initiatives in that area. We'd also be targeting investments to come into the agro-processing area where we can start doing the root crops and we can start juicing uh, all of these uh, large quantities of fruit that we have, much of it going to waste. Is it going to be a government, government uh, institution taking care of that, or is it going to be pr the private sector? We're going, to, we're going to encourage the private sector to get involved in that. And um, we know that there, there are already areas of interest, and we are speaking with a number of people uh, who are well positioned to be able to make some quick headway in that regard. So, so we have agriculture to fix. Agriculture is not going to get better in Dominica, man. If we, if if some agency of government does not commit to to buying the products of the farmers that we have said we can guarantee markets for. This business of farmers going to the farm, having the responsibility of ensuring the right quality and then coming out and having to go and find the markets for themselves and so on, it's not going to encourage people into farming. The government must take the responsibility to identify the markets for targeted products, let the farmers go out and plant, and what the farmers have produced to standards, to quality standards, we buy everything and we, we get it to the market. So, so there's a lot of work to be done in that regard, but there's also a lot of rethinking to do in terms of areas of strategic interest to us, which have not been paid attention to. You know, for years we were very good in coconut oil um, because we had copra, and so we were planting a lot of coconuts. We had a coconut rehabilitation program that gave us great um, production. Um, and for years, we were selling much of the copper to Dominica Coconut Products. We didn't sell a lot of coconut oil for use in the kitchen because they told us it had cholesterol and so on. This is the era now where coconut oil is on the world top ten, world top ten list of foods. It is. It is. It has. It's given higher ratings than all of the oils we heard in the past were so wonderful, like olive and and, and palm oil and and even flaxseed oil and so on. Coconut oil now in terms of health benefits and so on, is ahead of those. Th that should tell us what some of the possibilities are for us. And, and those are the kinds of things that we will explore in earnest and put Dominique in a position where it is earning a larger share of the global market in those strategically important products. In, in terms of, of tourism, uh, you know, again, it, it, the landscape down here and, and some of the things that can happen in terms of the eco-properties and so on, uh, how we... How we encourage investors to come on board and to build the kind of properties that will attract international attention so that so that with uh, a small 20 30 room facility that is beautifully done with stone and wood bamboo and so on you see these lovely ecotourism properties in other parts of the world with with excellent luxury components in them and you ask why why have we not been able to do that in the nature island of the Caribbean, which, which would be a nice natural fit now for us? And, and part of the revival of, of, of the rethinking and the renewing of our, of our tourism is exactly that, that we, we will encourage um, the, the setting up, or the establishment of more hotel room, expanding our room capability, but being careful that those rooms that we're expanding into are in the character and in the appeal, the nature and the appeal that we want to bring to the rest of the world. We have uh, the, the, the question of the renewable energy area to consider as well, and the fact that we have made so little progress with renewables. We, we've spent over $50 million on the, on the geothermal? geothermal up in the, in the valley area. Yeah. Would you continue if at all you become the Prime Minister? Well, science will decide that. You know, right now I don't get the sense that this government is being guided by science. I think the government is being guided by uh, uh, a desire um, to do something. Whether it, it, it 
regardless of what the consequences are, the government is just going ahead. We say safety first. Nothing that we do in development of Dominica is worth people getting hurt over, worth people dying over, worth people having massive dis dislocations in their lives. And so geothermal is not new. It has been done in many areas of the world, but, but we must be guided by what has been done in other areas. And we must be sensitive to the fact that we are a different country. We have a, a, a geo geological nature, a geological characteristic that is different to many of the other countries where you have found um, these, this kind of um, geothermal resource. And so the, the honesty and the integrity of the environmental impact assessment study is critical as we get into this. What is it that we are going to be able to do? The environmental impact assessment study must tell us that up front based on the principles of science, based on the principles of hydrology and geology, which are not new. We're not inventing them. We simply need to honestly bring them to the table because the question that the people of Dominica are asking, especially those in the Rosa Valley, Manai, is, okay, if you want to generate 20 megawatts of power from the geothermal resource up in the Loda, Trafalgar area, that's fine. That's what you want to do. What we, the people of Dominica, want to know is, will you be able to do that without significant damage to the natural environment, without threats, continuing threats, without dislocation? So are you saying lands? that the government did not take that into consideration? What is happening now suggests to me that it was not, if, if it was done at all, there were a lot of shortcomings in what was done because now the people of the area are observing cracks in the in the in the land they're observing slippages um they're talking about um bubbling water in the in the in the Titu Gorge area and so on uh, things that they had not seen before things that they believe may well be linked to all of this drilling that has been taking place on an experimental basis and and now they say okay we drilled here but okay maybe that's not where we're supposed to drill so we want to drill over here instead and we need to shut down this well so we need to put some water because it's hot we need to cool it so we need to bring some water from the teeth experimentation was that part of the environment did did they foresee that in the environmental impact assessment study i don't think they did so so the, so the question is what exactly are they doing right now based on the science that should be informing what's going on there there's a lot of disquiet people are no longer people are no longer satisfied that the government and its its operatives in the area know what they're doing and it would help if the government were to come clean with the people take a pause and and have some resources come in to assess what is really going on apart from that you are in support of this uh... the idea is fine but i'm not going to i'm not going to be part of any government that is destroying lives in Dominica or destroying the natural environment for the benefit of 20 megawatts or more of geothermal power. If we can do it, there is a way that can be done. Let's get it done properly. But let's not be reckless about it. That's all I'm saying. You, would you accept foreigners, I mean Dominicans living in the foreign, coming down to take part in the general election voting for either party? Yes. You do. Absolutely. The, the, the law, the law, man, is clear. Um, it says if you've been living outside of Dominica for more than five years and you have not returned, then you need to re-register. Not that, not that you are disqualified from voting, but if you've been more, out for more than five years, it may well be that you, you no longer have any interest in voting our elections. So it would be good to renew that interest and re-register. Fine. The, the law also says that somebody should not be bribed for their vote bribery treating against the provisions of the house of assembly elections act so when we when we look at what 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 happened in 2005 and again in 2009 in a much bigger way where we saw these large numbers of dominicans coming in um being paid their paying fares and so on from another jurisdiction paid to come into dominica some of them receiving pocket money for the one or two days that they're there in order to vote that's blatant bribery and that's blatant illegal activity according to the provisions of the House of Assembly Elections Act. Not, not Lennox Linton's thoughts or concerns. Our law. Our law, documented and clear. And, and so, 
while we would like and we have no issue with Dominicans overseas maintaining an interest in their country because they do that you know it's not just about elections you know man it's about all of the barrels they send it's about all of the money that comes through Western Union comes through MoneyGram and so on to help their families down here it's about the little bikes that they send it's about the second hand vehicles that they use to help their family with down here you have a relationship between Dominicans living on the ground here and their brothers and sisters who've gone overseas that has benefited this country significantly over years what we would like to do is to facilitate that relationship to ensure that it's working even better for the Commonwealth of Dominica but in terms of voting we don't want laws broken because we're a country of laws and so we ask the people overseas to do it properly you want to come down to vote pay a passage come down spend two weeks spend a week or spend a few days if the weekend is all you have you know when the election date is going to be make your arrangements to come down here and vote once you once you are registered and you are eligible to vote we have we have a bigger concern though it's about it's about the the list for the elect for the election and it's about whether or not we're going to be able to vote the ID cards you know which was a promise but it seems like, i don't know what the electoral commission is doing in that regard your talk show you have been hosting a talk show i think now you have you are no longer the the, the host no, i'm no, I'm uh, no i do between, i do it occasionally but i'm between no you and me Be between, between you and me many allega allegations on that, that said program show of yours you being the elected as the leader of the country uh what is going to be in the next move in terms of all of the allegations that you mentioned on your show man i as the host of between you and me i functioned in a media practice capacity in in our democracy media brings things to light where matters need to be prosecuted because something wrong has happened, the interest of the state has been injured, that's not media, that's another entity. That's uh, the prosecutorial work of the Director of Public Prosecutions, maybe the Attorney General can come into the picture in his independent function. But as Prime exactly Minister, you, you are going to give, uh, uh, put a lot of energy to enable uh, all of these allegations that you stated on your show. No, well, no, well, I, I'm, I'm not, I am going to ensure, as Prime Minister, um, we, our team, has a commitment to ensure that the institutions of state are functioning and they're properly resourced. So, so for example, um, this business of investigating crimes against the state, that's a matter for the law enforcement people. And so all we will do is not, is not to go after those things ourselves, but to ensure that the, the, the agencies responsible have the resources in terms of the human, the physical, and the financial resources to enable them to investigate and if necessary to prosecute but we ourselves now as ministers have roles have important functions to play to ensure that we get the economy to grow by five to seven percent so we're not going to be witch hunting we're not we're not going to be entering into government deciding well oh we have to go after that one this one that one crimes are being committed about against the state though and those have to be prosecuted those have to be investigated and hopefully prosecuted but that's not going to be the, the, the role of the cabinet the, the, the resources will be allocated so that the relevant departments of government can do their work. So how are you going to institute the, the IPO, which is kind of not been that effective as it's supposed to be? Well, I've had some personal experience with the IPO, as you know. Uh, <laughs> as we speak, I have a case before the IPO uh, involving Mr. Skerritt because um, the IPO had decided that the complaint I had that he... Uh, granted concessions to a company which he had a personal interest as head of cabinet he had a personal interest and he granted concessions to this company needed to be investigated and then his lawyers got into the way and have been stalling and have been um, you know putting up all delaying tactics and they're in court right now and so on uh, the IPO has made recommendations as to how the institution itself can become more effective we'll pay attention to those uh, but one of the first things, uh, importantly, Manai, is that we in government must set the example that allows the IPO to do its work. So, for example, if I am accused of something and somebody files a complaint against me, all I have to do is step back and allow the IPO to work. I'm not going to be going involved in all of these court this and that to prevent the IPO from making a simple inquiry because all the IPO can do, by the way, is to investigate 
and make a report available to the president and to the to the director of public prosecutions. The IPO cannot find you guilty of anything. It can simply present its report for further action. And the courts will do the finding of guilt or innocence. So for me, the principal thing to do as a person in public life, to set the example that we believe the IPO is an important institution, when, even when it affects us, let the IPO do its work. When Mr. Astafan tries his utmost to to disassociate people who have political leanings to be uh, 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 part of the IPU, how do you see that? I see that as being disingenuous, uh, highly hypocritical. The ruling party has no problem with Vanus John Charles, a uh, blatant political activist, on the IPU as the no as a nominee for the government, the the, Dom the Dominican Labour Party. But Mr. Asifan raises hell with every single person that the, that the United Workers' Party nominates to the IPO. I don't know whether he feels the United Workers' Party needs to nominate him there so that the people can be satisfied. But I, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. We, are not, we don't take instructions uh, from Mr. Astafan. His point of view is not important to us. And so we will continue to select people of high repute and high integrity who we feel can bring value to the work of the IPO, as we have done in this case. And do you th would you think also it would be of an interest if the IPO, the members of the IPO are foreigners? I think we can handle this. I think we can do this for ourselves. We, we have, you, you see, important thing, man, I... Let me have a call there. Let's see who's there. Hello. Good evening. Hello. Good evening, man. I good yes. evening to Mr. Linton. Good, 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 evening. E good evening, my brother. Randy and Dominic. That's, that's the command sergeant major. Hello. <laughs> no. Very good evening to you. Thank you very much, sir, and a uh, belated happy well, Mother's Day to your, to your wife, to your beautiful wife. Thank you very much. Good. Lennox, let me say to you that I am thrilled, I'm excited that you are in Grand Bay, and you are letting the Grand Bayians know who you are, and you are going to dispel all the myths and all the propaganda, lies and deception, that the Skerritt Cabal, along with Justina Charles and her likes, been getting away with. Lennox, I don't know how easy it's going to be for our people to understand that the current government doesn't care, never cared about Grand Bay, lied it to Grand Bay, and they did that deliberate lies they continue to give Grand Bay, give nothing to the people, but yet still the people are so crazy. It's like a cult behind the Labour Party. I am glad you are here tonight in Grand Bay explaining to the Grand Bay people there is something far better than what they've been getting for the last 15 or 10 years. Lennox, I'm glad you mentioned about having our produce going back and forth from Martinique to the south, which is only about 25 or 30 clicks. And I am glad that you recognize we still have potential and there is a propensity to have some kind of sustainable e economy for Grand Bay and Dominica. So thank you very much. I'm not going to take too much of your time. Mana, you are doing a good job. And I just want more visibility of the people who want to change things in Grand Bay and Dominica to show up in Grand Bay and try to dispel the lies. Grandarians need to understand they are living in La La Land when they listen and they believe the things that Kerry's been telling them. It's been lies and lies and lies all the time. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank and you. Have a pleasant evening. And Grand Bay and all the mothers out there, have a happy Mother's Day. And to the, right. lovely, to the lovely Marilyn Alcindor there in Atlanta, Georgia, a very happy Mother's Day to you. Miss Linton, the, the hour has went yeah, so quickly. It's gone by. But, <laughs> but before we move, there are uh, certain questions I'd like to ask you, and I'll ask you to permit us an extra uh, 10 minutes if it's not okay. of, uh, too much okay. of uh, 
Uh, yeah, that's, okay, that's, okay. that's cool. That's cool. Okay, uh, we heard that you... Is it the humbleness when you came out and said that you were a novice in politics? Mm -hmm. Were you trying to uh, be humble? And, uh, no, I was just stating fact. A, a no novice means that you're new to the field. Oh, that does not mean that you need to be trained to, to, be, com to be qualified in the field. Well, As a you novice, know, you, you're kind yeah, of no, primitive, no? <laughs> no? <laughs> Is it no, that? I, I, didn't, I didn't take it to mean that. I, okay, I, okay. I, I, was, I, was getting, I was getting into something that I was uh, capable of, of doing, okay. but, but it was new to me. New to you. Okay, yeah, we have a call. Let us see who is there. Hello, good evening. Yes, good evening, and how are you? You're fine, thank you. Yes, I am listening to your program. Yes, Good thanks. evening, Mr. Maglo, how are you? Not too bad on you, sir. Very good, very good. And good evening to Mr. Linton. Yes, sir. Yes, I glad you got that attention because some people, they might feel for them, it is all right. As you said, you have to do things in proper manner. You have to come to explain to the people, to discuss with the people, because they do that, they didn't say nothing. Up to last Thursday, we had a meeting, and when I bring seven questions to Mr. Blackmore, he was mumbling, he couldn't answer. So when I see he couldn't answer, I, t I call on the public and I tell them the only choice we have when they're going to switch that on, we'll have to go in the top of the shrine and to block the road so nothing couldn't pass. They only put that little piece, Mr. Ralph Magro, want to, he said he's going to block the road. But the question I asked Mr. Blackmore and Mr. George, Mr. George only showing us, and he keep two meetings already, no response, he bring Mr. Blackmore, and they there, when they bring that, and I bring attention to Mr. Blackmore, put question in front of him, he there mumbling, he couldn't give questions, so I glad you mentioned about that, you former, because it's not so people, even we need income, but you don't do that with people, who, especially in our village, and to put that, and I get information, and I getting information, Matnik or Guadalupe, yeah, they have that geophoma, they have it by the sea, and they're even taking the sea water. But as you can see, look at where they take it, right at the back of rebalancing tank, and that's going to affect us very bad, and we have too much water or wind where they can induce the electricity and not to affect the people. Good night, sir, and have an idea following, and have a pleasant evening. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, Mr. Maglo, thanks for calling. Uh, Mr. Linton, let's con continue the discussion. How close are you to Mr. Scarity? If you meet uh, in a social activity, do you collaborate? Do you... <laughs> I, I know Mr. Scarit quite well. Actually, uh, Mr. Scarit grew up in a household, uh, the household of uh, Lipson and Stella Scarit in, in Vegas. Lipson... No, Lipson... And Stella Libla, sorry, Lipson and Stella Libla. Lipson Libla was a very close friend of my father, and uh, over the years um, that friendship was maintained. And, and so, I knew the the family because of, of that original connection to my father. Um, years later, uh, the the only daughter of of Lipson in that marriage. Uh, was my as administrative assistant at, at Dominica Coconut Products, and um, she since moved on and did a degree in, in finance in the in the United States. I I know Roosevelt very well from that family connection, um, and so you know I, I th there even pictures of, of Roosevelt carried with my with my children on on the porch of the home of Stella in in. Um, and Vague has I have a call, Mr. Linton. Pictures and so on. We'll talk about yeah. Okay. We'll okay. Hello. Good evening. Good evening. How, are you guys? How are you doing, Mamai? I'm doing fine, and you? Okay. We have Mr. Linton in the house. Yes, special meeting to, me, um, to Mr. Um, special evening to Mr. Linton. Good evening to you, sir. Yes, and I want to tell you, Mr. Linton, you are more than welcome, and in Grand Bay, we welcome you with... Um, <laughs> Thank you. And I also would like to extend a special Mother's Day to your wife. And hope she and the kids and everybody are fine. Right, she's listening to you. Th I, I'm um, sure she she wishes me to say thanks on her yes, behalf. Because you, you you seem to be a very humble politician, and I want to tell you straight, I'm very honest with that. I believe you. I believe you're a politician with the character that good politicians possess. Now we can understand that the government has failed to at least pay any kind of recognition to the Gambian people, the, especially this current government. We understand that. 
We all listened to the rally at St. Joseph. We saw we gave overwhelming support and unwavering support to this present government. And we understand that he did, um, they didn't say anything in regards to the development of Granby. Whatever you said about your plans for this community, we we are confident and we profoundly believe what you said because we saw the behavior of the past government, which was the UWP, and we saw what kind of development that we got in Granby within four years while they were in office. So all what you said about the plans that you have for Granby, we believe you, and we're telling you that we would like you to return to Granby to give us much more information about your plans for the community and Dominica. And we are proud of you. You have a very good night. Thank you. Thank you, sir. We will. So it seems to, to full, me you full, were welcome in Granby. <laughs> Four lines are busy. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just a pity that we, we're about to arrive to the end. Yeah, but, but I was saying... Yes, uh, go, so go so ahead. I, yeah. So I know, I know, I know him very well. As a matter of fact... Um, when um, the, the, his stepfather died, the, the house in which he grew up was Lipson Leblanc's house, as I told you. And when Lipson died, um, the Stella asked my dad to do the eulogy, and uh, my dad said this is something he couldn't do. So she said, "If not to you, then it has to be your son Lennox." So I actually gave the eulogy at Lipson's uh, uh, Lipson Leblanc's funeral uh, back in some years ago. And it was interesting because in those days, um, Roosevelt Skerritt was the education minister. And uh, the cabinet was um, seated in the front row there. And I walked up to give the eulogy. And there was, uh, you know, people looking to say, well, you know, is this, where, where is this guy going? <laughs> because they were not aware of the of the, of of the, the relationship, family, or the, the contact. Family connection. So, so I say that to say that there's nothing personal against Roosevelt Skerritt. As a matter of fact, this is, this is someone I would have liked to see do well in the position of prime minister. But when, when we come to deal with the business of the nation, we cannot be talking brother and sister or friend or, or who is close to us. If, if they're close to us, but they're not doing what their responsibility requires them to do, and they're not acting honestly in the public interest, then we have a responsibility to speak, and that's all there is between Scared and myself. I feel that he has, done a no he has gone down the wrong road, and he has embroiled the, the, the country in a series of corrupt activities for the personal benefit of himself and other ministers of government, and I can't support that, not because I know you and your family, or because I was close to your parents, or families were close means that I must sit down and shut up about that. And I wish the people of Dominica would listen carefully because this is not about Roosevelt's carry personally. This is about what he has done to injure the public interest of Dominica. And, and that's why I stand. Not because I dislike him as a, as a human being, but I dislike what he has used his position in government to do. So what do you have to say about, uh, about his achievements from since he has been uh, uh, the leader of the island, of the country, I, I the stadium... We have projects. Uh, yeah, these, are, projects. These, are, these are projects. So, what do you have to say about them? Those well, he has he has been responsible for bringing in some money to the country that gave us projects. Now, I also sat down in the BVI, in court in the BVI, listened to his former ambassador David Sue say to court in the BVI that all of these projects that we have in Dominica, he was the one who negotiated for them. Now, that testimony on the oath in the BVI court from David Sue was never challenged. It went to a court unchallenged. So, so I, who did he negotiate it with? Who is that? I mean, David Sue, the, the guy. Uh, used David Sue. I, I guess. I guess his the with the Chinese. I guess his connection to the Chinese. That's what okay. he said. That's what he said. You know, I'm not. Okay. I'm not. Um, I'm not telling you what somebody else told me he said. I'm, okay. te I'm telling you what I heard him say on the oath in the court in the BVI. So, so when we hear about these 19 hours of negotiation that went on in Beijing as a result of which we got this and that and that, David Sue said all that was his work. Right. Now, it, it seems to me that with most things, the, the government has been, this, this government of the Roosevelt Square has been concerned with what individual ministers can get out of certain kinds of arrangements in, in, in the foreign so you've seen our diplomatic passports for example being sold when these diplomatic passports are sold there is no money not one red cent that goes into the treasury remember the economic citizenship program which deals with regular passports is where we get fees from these transactions coming into the treasury the diplomatic passport money goes directly into the hands of ministers and their operatives and we had the ugly case of Francesco Corallo in 2012 
being on Interpol's most wanted list of criminals around the world holding our diplomatic passport now if that does not concern you man I and if that not, does not concern the people of Dominica it clearly concerns me because it is unacceptable for us to have such shoddy due diligence on who we are giving our passports to but it seems that it doesn't matter because once you have the money and usually it will be the money from questionable sources that is available in large enough quantities to purchase the passport for two million US or one million US or whatever price tag they have on it we have to change that we have to bring our country back to decency again we have to become a responsible citizen of the global community and that is one of the reasons for which I stand okay let's refer to the, in the days of Mr. Patrick John the, his minister of finance was Mr. Vic Rivière I just can't recall the interim government by OJ, who was the Minister of Finance, can you recall? Wasn't it Mike? Okay, it was Mike, and then the then Mary Eugenia Charles was the Minister of Finance yes. herself. Yes. Mr. James came in, He, uh, Mr. Timothy was the Minister of Finance, mm -hmm. and uh, Mr. Douglas came in, uh, Mr. Ambrose jo George. Ambrose George, yes. Yes, and then... Uh, who else? Mr. For, Pierre Charles. Mr. Pierre Charles retained the yeah, yeah, Minister of Finance. And as well as Mr. Skerritt. Right. Now you come right. in and Mr. Fountain is going to be your Minister of Finance. Right. Why not you, uh, uh, tra as it's been done traditionally, the Prime Minister holds the post? Well, it's not, it's not really traditional. It, some, some Prime Ministers have functioned uh, as Finance Minister and some have not. Yes. In circumstances where we have uh, available to us on the team and available to the people of Dominica somebody with the credentials of Thompson Fontaine in economic management and financial affairs he is a choice the best choice for the Ministry of Finance as we have other people who will be make excellent choices for other departments of government my, my role is a leadership role my role is like uh, almost like a coach on the team that that seeks to make everybody better and, and ensure that we are working according to plan and if, if plan is not unfolding call a timeout and, and and sit down and redraft right that's what leaders do so so I'm not obsessed with holding any particular ministry of government I am concerned with the responsibility that has been bestowed on me which is the leadership responsibility and how it is that I use my experience and I use my ability to ensure that all of these critical functions of government are working properly under the people that have been assigned to take care of them. The United, Work, uh, United Workers Party executive choose you as the leader. Mm -hmm. There are other elements in the party who were there a long time before you. Mm -hmm. Why you are the first choice? Well, l l let's remember how it happened, man. I, um, <laughs> Edison James, the, the Honorable Edison James, the Marigot constituency representative since uh, 1990, indicated last year that he would not stand for re-election in the next election. And so the constituency association of the Marigot branch, the UWP, Marigot constituency association, asked whether I would consider stepping in for him, uh, be, become their, their representative. I agreed. And having agreed to that, I w it was said to me, well, bear in mind Mr. James is the political leader of the party, so there is a vacancy in the political leadership as well. The convention that is coming up is going to have to elect a leader. Will you accept our nomination? Now, I, I cannot be replacing Mr. James in the Margaret constituency, the Margaret constituency indicating that they want to uh, nominate me for the leadership position and decline. So I accepted it, having accepted that I would stand as the representative so that's the way it went out and then the the people of the party around the country sort of caught on to the idea and when we went to the nominations committee which is where the the body decides on the recommendations that are going to go forward to the convention for the filling of certain of, of the positions on the executive uh, the vote in the nominations committee went 16 for me one for Senator Isidore and one for Claudia Sanford, the deputy political leader of the party. So it was on that basis that they sent my name forward to the convention and I was elected unopposed. I, I have been 
involved in the uh, political affairs of, of Dominica in a different kind of way, not, not being in a political party, but uh, pointing attention to the standards of good governance. So your, your acceptation of the, of the position was a spontaneous thing? What, was yeah, well, I, you know, I, I thought it... I, actually, back in 2012, uh, the end of 2012, I did say that I would be contesting the next elections in Dominica because um, I, th I just felt that... Remember we stop? We have a call here. Hello? Hello? Okay. Hello. I missed the call. Sorry. Yes, and, and um, I just felt we'd come to a stage where a number of us had been talking and talking and it seemed as though some of us knew better but we were depending on other people who may not know, have known better to be doing better for us. And, and so on the principle that it is those among us who know and who are who are passionate enough and interested enough to point the way forward that should get involved and stop sitting on the fence i decided hey i, I want to do this i want to i want to get involved in, in in political life i didn't know yet what that meant at that time i was working with my colleagues in the mm -hmm. citizens forum on um on a number, a number of initiatives uh, to do with the good governance of Dominique and so on, uh, but it turns out that I was I was asked, and I, I've always been um, open to to that kind of inquiry, and I I responded positively. Should we expect a, a blue clinic? No. No. What is going to replace it? What is going to replace it? Yeah. The I mean welfare, the, red, the, 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 yeah. the welfare department of Dominica will handle the welfare needs of the people of Dominica. There's an entity in the government where we, we're supposed to have resources, human resources that do the assessments of need and are able to respond to what the needs are. My, I've always argued that if there's a difficulty of how speedily they respond, we should speed up their capability to respond as opposed to locating the handing out of favors from the Prime Minister's office for the Prime Minister's personal political benefit. So that you, you will see a properly functioning welfare department catering for the welfare needs of the people of Dominica and not a clinic operating out of the office of Prime Minister where Prime Minister is doling out public favors with the people's money. It's, it's doling out favors with the people's money for his private political benefit. I'm not in that. How do you see the housing uh, given, uh, houses given to underprivileged people? Do you, would you also put a, a hold Gov on that? Governments, governments have always assisted folks who are not able to fend for themselves with housing, w with other social needs, and, and that will continue. What will not continue is the abuse of the resources that are allocated for these housing programs. Where, where people are talking about those in need, we have uh, the girlfriends of, of ministers who are receiving more than their fair share, and so on and so on and so on. The corruption has to stop, man. I not, not, not that every time you talk about uh, these programs and that like they say you don't like them or you will stop them. Let me make it clear. We have no intentions at all of stopping any program that is catering for the welfare and the social needs of those who are less fortunate than ordinary. But what will stop happening is that ministers will not have the capability of utilizing those resources for their personal or private benefit. That will stop. So that those who really need it, based on merit, will get the state's assistance. This is not our money. This, this money does not so belong to us. So no matter what color you are, yeah, you come to the state. Merit. 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 So what about with small businesses such as ours? Hmm? Small bu assistance for businesses such, such as Radio Bamago and other uh, uh, businesses all around or, or in the other villages. There's a small business unit, isn't there, Manai? Isn't there a small business unit? Yeah, I know that. Okay. Have you tried to get assistance from them? Oh, boy. Hmm? The, uh, this, you, I, I would not want you to interview me tonight. Oh, okay. Right, okay. <laughs> well, 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 man, I give, me another chance, give me a chance to come back and interview you. On this yeah, okay, I, I, I will <laughs> give you a chance. We have a call there. <laughs> All right. Let's go. Hello. Good evening. Good evening. Go ahead, sir. Good evening, Mr. Linton. Good evening, sir. How are you doing? Uh, Mr. Linton, let me tell you. If you need to from the government, do you have any idea about the 15% VAT? 
No, what, what we what we have to review we have to review the VAT. Um, one of the things up front that I find about the VAT, bro, is that it it is when we implemented VAT here, we didn't do what a number of the other islands in the Caribbean did, and probably that's the first thing we should do, right? Which is exempt certain food items that are generally used by the people of Dominica from the VAT, right? Ease up housing and construction materials from the VAT so that more people have an easier time building their own homes and that can in itself create a, a, a big a boost in the economic performance of Dominica. But also on, on, the, on the exemption from certain, the exemption of certain food items, that would make the cost of living a lot more bearable because a lot of people are suffering in Dominica. And it, years ago, it was suggested by none other than Mr. Philip Nassif that we should consider a basket of goods that the the food items that the VAT is exempt on, and um, the government never paid attention. You know, so I think we have to look at it because we we have clearly we have a responsibility to make the cost of living um, less burdensome for the people. What about the cost of electricity? How do you see? I will know. With Dominic is a private mm -hmm. enterprise, the government might not uh, be able to in, interfere. But what would you want to say to our listeners that your administration would do to enable the cost of electricity to drop a little? Well, we we definitely will be going after the renewables in a more aggressive, a more organized, and a more focused way. That means we will see results from initiatives in wind, initiatives in solar, initiatives in hydro. And, and hopefully we'll do a better job of uh, seeing what can be done with the geothermal resources without injuring the environment and without impacting the lives of people. Uh, it, 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 is, it, is through that, it is through that those renewables that we are going to see a reduction in the electricity bills. Um, the, the cost of fuel, um, the, the cost of diesel and so on is a little bit down, down today up tomorrow. All right? And in any event, the burning of fossil fuels has an impact on the environment that we'd like to avoid. It, 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 it increases our carbon footprint, and we want to move away from that as we become the best place to live, the best place to work, and the best place to enjoy life. And so it is in the renewables that we see hope. And we are disappointed that the government has not done more with solar, for example. There's not a single public building in Dominica that has been powered by solar. Even the more recent multi-million dollar buildings, you look at the state college, you look at the, the state palace, no solar panels, no capability for solar power to those recently established buildings. And you look at schools, which school around the country that we were paying electricity for is powered by solar. Not one in any remote area of Dominica where, where we, have a lot of, we have a lot of sunshine and um, we have the capability to do much better there. So, so the, the, the reduction in the cost of electricity is going to come a lot from our focus on renewables. And I think we'll do a, a very good job there. So otherwise, how do you see the... the, 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 the chances of your party forming the government in the next coming elections? Chances are good, man. I. The chances are good. We, we are around Dominica. The, the ground um, is favorable. We, we meet people every day who are in the mood for change. Um, there are a few, I think there are a few surprises coming to this Dominica Labour Party who believes it, it has it um, all figured out. Um, I, I just I'm, I'm watching some trends in, in certain constituencies and I'm very happy with what I see, especially with the movement of young people. Okay, when you looked at what transpired at St. Joseph mm -hmm. uh, couple, I think uh, last, last week? Last week, uh, last week Monday. You probably had the, the you probably saw the pictures and the amount of people who went there. Mm -hmm. uh, what would you have to say about the population that went to uh, participate in that movement? Dominicans, Dominicans generally are big on political rallies. They attend political rallies, especially those that are very well advertised. And this one was very well advertised over a period of about two months. And a significant amount of resources were put behind it. But, you know, how easily people forget. We had a rally in Londonderry on the 29th of September 2013 eight months ago which in my view based on what I saw was bigger than this Labour Party rally 
in St. Joseph. We also had at the end of Coast to Coast in 25, on the 1st of December, the Pollersville Savannah, another rally which had more people than the St. Joseph rally. But now the St. Joseph rally has come. Obviously, there were a number of people there. The Prime Minister said uh, the police stopped counting when they reached 20,000. I don't know where he got that because it, uh, the police um, players who have been in special branch and so on over the years, people have been estimating crowds and so on, say you couldn't fit any more than six to 7,000 people in that location in any event. Um, but the Prime Minister saw 20,000. I don't know why he didn't call election, but he saw 20,000. What, 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 <laughs> were, uh, were you expecting him to deliver the uh, date? Yeah, he, may, he may have. I thought, I thought he might have. Or <laughs> <laughs> he, he changed have. his mind? <laughs> <laughs> something like that. Something like that. Okay. But, but, but what, what was interesting for me, man, I, is that this was billed as a stepping out a rally of the Labour Party. In other words, the Labour Party was in the doldrums politically. They were um, looking at United Workers Party doing all these things, embracing, engaging with the public, bonding with the public and, and the voters of Dominica on critical issues. And then they decided, well, it's time for us to step out. So, so two months ago, they started promoting this and they stepped out. They chose St. Joseph to step out. St. Joseph is the village that records, as far as the 2008-2009 census is concerned, 48.6% poverty. 47.6% poverty in St. Joseph. In that whole rally, not one single word, not one single word from any speaker about what this Labour Party planned to do to improve the village economy in St. Joseph. But that was the place they chose to go to the rally. And in choosing that location, it didn't occur to anybody that the people down there have real concerns about employment. They have real concerns about cost of living. They have real concerns about how they're going to continue to participate in this economy and help it to grow. They have real concerns about their children, how they're growing up. So the state of social services, the rule of law. Not one, not one word from this DLP government on what they're going to do to improve St. Joe. The place they chose for the stepping out rally. Tells you something. Okay, <laughs> lovely. Ah, Mr. <laughs> Mr. <laughs> Linton, uh, you said, oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, thank you, thank you. I said thank you. <laughs> Who are you saying thank you to? <laughs> I'm saying thank you to you, my friend, because I noticed that um, our time, we've exceeded our, our, our time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's always an honor having people of your type coming to our, our little uh, radio station in the community of South, City Grande, and we are very happy having you here. And uh, Mr. James has came there, yeah, yeah. In, uh, and uh, many of the other prime ministers have entered there. Rusi himself. We have had many in, uh, interviews with different prime ministers right, right. and leaders of the opposition parties as well. But Mr. S Mr. Skerritt has not. Uh, we have not had the chance. He will, he will be here. He will be here soon. <laughs> I'll try my best soon. to see. Maybe maybe Manai maybe Manai you yeah. might be the first to to host uh, a debate between Mr. Skerritt and myself. <laughs> it will probably happen right here at Radio Abamango. I want I want to thank Paribel, you. Paribel has not accepted it. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I don't want I want to thank you and I want to applaud you for your, your effort in, in community radio. You want to take this call? <laughs> final final one? Yeah, final one. Yeah, Go ahead. Good evening. Good evening. Good, Good evening. Good evening, Mr. Linton. Talking time on Radio Abamango. Thank you for joining us. Mr. Linton, let me tell you. You have any plan to organize a meeting with the private sector in Dominica, all private sector? If I have any plan to? To organize a meeting with all private sector in Dominica. I'm hearing private sector, but I'm not hearing all all of them. All of the, the if, private sector. If if I have a plan. plan to have a meeting with them. Oh yes, oh yes, oh yes, oh yes. We we this is something we we have we have started, and um, we did engage with the private sector when we were uh, putting our our jobs um, program together, and it's something we have to continue doing, man. I because uh, after all, these are the players whether they be in industry or commerce or in, in whether they be in the in the tourism sector, the manufacturing sector, it's important for the stakeholders to speak with clarity to the government about how they see the economy getting better. What has happened over years which um which which disappoints me is that these segments of our society, these um stakeholders have been talking to government. They have been making recommendations to government. But the government has not been implementing those recommendations. It's almost like there's no respect. So, so the government is sitting down with them for the 
public relations benefit of sitting down with them and when you look for where the rubber hits the road where the proof is supposed to be the proof of the pudding is supposed to be in the eating you don't see implementation of the recommendations and so that creates a, a distrust among the stakeholders it creates a, a feeling of well you know we don't care um, nobody listens um, they, they speak to us but we don't see any real uh, we, we want to change that it's important that that changes because it's not the wisdom does not reside only in the heads of people who put themselves forward for political office and succeed it is still a country that belongs to all of us and we will do a lot better for the country if we meaningfully engage with the key stakeholders in the relevant areas of our economic endeavors and, and development endeavors and ensure that they too are playing their role in the development of Dominica. Before you go, tell us of what do you think of the village council, the, the laws that govern the village councils today uh, makes it difficult for civil servants to be active at the, at, at the, at the village council, at the village councils all over the island. Would you want to change that? It's something we have to look at. Uh, I mean, uh, public officers, um, I don't know why that bar is there. Uh, when you think about it just off the cuff, it appears that it's there because uh, maybe the framers felt that some conflict may emerge between a player on the village council team and the government that is supposed to work, be working along with the village council. So uh, there's that. Um, you know, over the years, uh, the government, government has said, or, or our, our rules have said, if you're a public officer, then you cannot be involved in overtly political activity. And if you want to go and make some statement or other, you must seek the, the uh, permission of your, or your head of department or something of the sort. All of these things, I think, intended to protect the public interest in some way, shape or form. But we have to grow up. We have to... Uh, understand that we function in a modern environment and there's some some changes that may be necessary um, to the extent that the the village councils are being starved for for talent because um, talent and capability because um, the public officers are not allowed to participate we have to look at what why that is the way it is and, and see what we change going forward okay what would you like to say to our listeners before you go I want to say to the listeners of Radio Amarango what a distinct pleasure and privilege it was for me sitting with you tonight, Manai. And uh, I, I, again, I want to applaud your, your wonderful effort in, in community radio and, and broadcasting uh, and keeping the, the Grand Bay and environs and wider Dominica informed on, on matters of importance to this area of, of, of Dominica. Uh, I, I know it has not been easy. Um, building initiatives like this and working with them over the years takes takes not only time and patience, it also takes money. And um, I, I wish you well. Thanks. <laughs> I wish you well, and, and I want to applaud your effort. Yeah. I want to also thank you for coming once more, and I look forward for the Sufriye Tetmon Link Road, <laughs> if at all you become the, the Prime uh, Minister. Ah, <laughs> Sufriye Tetmon Link Road, yes. <laughs> We need to open up the country some more. Okay. <laughs> and, and to all the, the patriots of the land, change is coming. God bless you. Thank you very much. What does that mean, Team Dominica? Team Dominica means uh, all of us working together. You see, political parties have this uh, thing that they divide. We, we want to heal the wounds of division in this country. We want to stop being a red or a blue or a green Dominica. We genuinely want to be the Commonwealth of Dominica. And so I say tonight um, in Grand Bay, I say welcome to the Team Dominica Liberals. Yes. <laughs> okay, then. Thank you, Mr. God bless you. God okay, bless you, man. Bye. All the best. Bye. <laughs> Asam no kabato, asam no kabese, asam no debate.